Hello, OG team. Paul Goodman is in Japan at the moment. Go get him, assassins. <laughs> Fortunately, before he left, he recorded a one quick thing. So, let's play it. Go on. <laughs> One quick thing, mm. podcast we do on the two weeks of a year when we acknowledge that this podcast is even more untenable than it usually is. <laughs> I'm Paul Baldwin. I'm Day's Target. <laughs> well, we finished off Mill Creek Entertainment's Gorehouse Grace last oh. year. Mm. And after briefly flirting with the idea of moving on to their anti Sidaris box set, which we dipped into for <laughs> Malibu the anti Semitic box set. <laughs> the anti-Semitic box set I've Uh-oh. got. Oh my god, Mill Creek, why? <laughs> why, please? I need you to not get cancelled. And yet I'm so sure you're going to. Uh, but yes, we decided not to do the uh, uh, the set after... Yeah. Well, we watched Malibu Express, but before that we kind of decided not to do it because it would mean just watching 11 more movies identical to Malibu Express, yeah. which we decided was a bad thing. Yeah, there's only so often... You can keep Beautiful locations, that. silly sense of humour, light-hearted sex, ridiculous action. Knockers flying about the place. That couldn't have possibly kept us happy for 11 more movies, could it? Not with... <sighs> not Baldwin in sight. Anyway. Fortunately... <laughs> Fortunately, we've got sweating bullets! <laughs> I guess hindsight is always twenty twenty, but looking back, it's still a bit fuzzy. Speaking of 2020, <laughs> that's the year this box set came out, which is adorable. <laughs> it's what the people needed. It's what the people needed in that year. Gorehouse Greats was 2009. Who needs that in 2009? People went outside. <laughs> yeah. District 9 came out in 2009. People were fine. People were fine in 2009 because District 9 was... That was the rhyme that Labour went into that election in 2010 with, and it didn't work. <laughs> Gordon Brown was trying to perform it to a bunch of racists. It's now Labour's new election for Keir Starmer. It's their new campaign. People were fine in 2009. Relive it. They've got some old 90s footballers to come in and do a rap on it. It's going to be good. They're going to do Things Can Only Get Better Again. Oh. Only it's a remix by Dizzy Rascal. <laughs> Who thinks they that Keir Starmer is still Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> they haven't listened to it yet. They assume it's going to be... It's going to be they, they say it's going to be word. That's what Keir Starmer's been saying. That's what he's been saying, and spiffing. So, yes, the box to uh, sweat, uh, sweating bullets, God, I'm hot, uh, <laughs> pr- promises a high-octane collection of maximum velocity action, and I have no reason to doubt the good people at the Gr- Mill Creek Entertainment after the Gorehouse yeah. Greats. After the Gorehouse <laughs> Greats went on to fulfil every single syllable of that promise. <laughs> Eventually, one at a time. <laughs> We've we, we suddenly got a sweaty movie for you today. <laughs> Sweatily reviewed and starred. Oh, God. Yes, anyway, after a great deal of deliberation, we settled on the two shortest films in the set. (laughs) Fuck you, us next year! (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't care about that cunt. (laughs) I'm never going to die! (laughs) Starting with the 1996 sci-fi action classic, Yesterday's Target. It's a covert government agency that investigates psychic activities in the United States. It was Holden's men who were trying to bring you into their research department. Research for what? You possess a strong telekinetic ability. Apparently you made quite an impression on that car. Try to remember. So I take it you from the future too long? From now on, we're going to do this thing my way. What is that? The historical record of our mission. Except we're three years behind. Action classic. Action classic. I can find out nothing about the making of this TV movie. It aired on Showtime in the States. Um, it was made by the inconspicuously made um, production company, IRS Media. Yes. <laughs> You'll get that film in six to eight weeks, mate. <laughs> uh. Maybe. It might be the movie wing of a defunct record label that used to um, issue records by REM, the Go-Go's, the Fine Young Can- uh. Cannibals, etc. Uh, whoever they are, they also made movies uh, like Live Nude Girls with Kim Cattrall. Ooh. Amanda and the Alien. Plughead Rewired, colon, Circuitry Man 2. <laughs> That's got a and Jackie for... Chan fran- like franchise <laughs> naming thing going on with it. 
<laughs> Circuitry Man 2 was actually unrelated. For one <laughs> sweet moment, I thought that they were involved in the making of Eraserhead, but it turns out that was just IRS Media putting out the soundtrack album. Which, by the way, buying the Eraserhead soundtrack back in 1980, <laughs> you're pretty fucking cool. If you still got that, that will have appreciated <laughs> greatly in hate and spite <laughs> for you. <laughs> Listen to it now. It'll, it'll blow your world away. The IRS got uh, David Buller to write it. Okay. Or perhaps Buller got the IRS to produce it, or both were hired by Showtime. I don't know. I have no information. <laughs> to reiterate, we're <laughs> as blind as Buller's, you are. This was Buller's first film credit. Uh, credit. He went on to write and direct When Time Expires, a hilarious name for an action movie. <laughs> I thought you were going to say When Time Explodes. Which when is Numbers Run much Out. <laughs> When time explodes. That was the alternate title for Tenet. <laughs> they, they got uh, uh. <laughs> they got Michael Gambon to come in and deliver the line. <laughs> what are you going to do when time explodes? <laughs> um, hmm? He also wrote some other movies, but his only other directing credits are these early naughty satire movies where they CGI the faces onto thumbs. So it's Bat Fum, Frank and Fum, and The God Fum. Oh. They're bad, but oh my God, they're so familiar. Yes, they really Jesus are. Christ, I can't place it, but I've seen them before. Maybe they used to go out on the Paramount Comedy Channel at 3 a.m. or something, but yeah. I know these things. It's like you'd see it on, it's, it feels like the kind of thing you'd see on either Rather Good, Channel 5, or New. Yeah, Channel 5. Maybe it made it onto like that um, Emily Booth thing. Yeah, but she used to show clips of stuff like Lone Wolf and Cub. It's yeah. just there's something. There's something there, isn't there? Yeah, I really can't place it. But as soon as yeah, oh god. Anyway, so we're in safe hands. Uh, the mm -hmm. film is directed by Barry Sampson. His mm -hmm. third film after Ice Porn and The Ice Runner. P O R N or P A W N? That is P A W N. Shame. I like Ice Porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do, you, do you feel up to it? No, no. <laughs> good, good, me neither. Hold me. <laughs> oh, yeah, now it's getting saucy. For warmth, just for warmth. <laughs> I always had that as a sexual fantasy when I was a teenager, like being with a sexy lady, and it's like, we're going to have to get close together for warmth. And it's like, our genitals have shrunk to a terrifying degree. My body's in survival mode. <laughs> what do you want from me? Wife. That's right. She was your wife in the fantasy. <laughs> she was. I had a very conservative fantasy life. Not before marriage, folks. And uh, if I wanted to fantasize about a different woman, I had to go for a lengthy divorce, imaginary divorce procedure. <laughs> like, come the end of which, you know, you just didn't have it in you to love another. But this ain't about love, kids. After this movie, he only directed once more The Good Life with Frank Stallone, Dennis Hopper, and Andrew Dice Clay. I really hope that is based on the old sitcom and it's Frank Stallone and. <laughs> Dennis Hopper moving out to the country where they have their eccentric neighbour, Andrew Dice Clay. Potentially. <laughs> and Patsy uh, Kensett still. Or it was directed by Paul Verhoeven, maybe. Susie Kendall. Maybe. One of them. Nope. I haven't got that right. Kendall Mink. Who was in The Good Life, folks? Right it's in, something because Kendall. I have no idea. Damn it, I love The Good Life. In what looks like a contemporary review in the TV Guide, mm -hmm. an unnamed critic writes... While the ruthless anti-mutant death squad is a neat concept, conceit, a cheap special effects budget precludes showing too much of the hero's paranormal powers in action, and the performances all strike a monotone note of grim resolve. God, mm. I love that. A mon it's monotone note of grim resolve. Who were you? Who were you, renegade anonymous crusader <laughs> of the night? <laughs> and why were you David Fincher? You were. <laughs> That's what I love most about you. <laughs> You're David Fincher. F N T S T C P L N T. Funskplunt on David Amazon again. said. David Fincher. <laughs> Maverick. <laughs> there are the kernels for a decent genre pot boiler here. Hmm. But don't waste your time scouring this wasteland of entertainment to find them. It's literally our job, my friend. <laughs> this is this is made for us. This was put on a single VHS and left on a, a skip. <laughs> In banger. <laughs> in my letterbox. The <laughs> film has 3.9 on IMDb, 1.5 on Rate Your Music, okay? And a lot of bad reviews on Letterboxd. So uh, for all yes. you Winstrom. Winstrom. <laughs> What's one thing about yesterday's target that made you want to travel to the past to make us watch the Andy Sidaris box set? Please, please do. Please. 
Um, oh god, I didn't. I didn't even write one down. Um, yeah. uh, uh, what's one from my list? Do you want IRS to take Media. Out? IRS Media, Paul. I already yeah. stole a Simpsons joke for this. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just go back to that. Remind everyone. Well, before that, mate, I got a very fancy Mill Creek Entertainment logo. That's 11 years of progress right there. Oh, you bought the box set, of course. I, I watched yeah. the DVD, yeah. Oh, that would be <laughs> nice. Now, here's, here's, a good, here's a good question, Paul. On the DVD, does it sound like all of the sounds in that movie is being hell, um, mate. fed through a flanger? I do. It sounds like there's someone left a fan on in their bloody sound recording at, um, office the Just, whole time. It's is, dreadful. Paul, get away from the window. Come on. You gotta get out of here. Come on. Just every time somebody gets in a car, fires a gun, or does anything using electrical machinery, you just get that. Uh, I don't know if Zoom's going to gate this or not. That. Like yep. going up and then down, hissing. Yeah, it was insane. Wow. It was on both. I compared. Video quality, negligible <laughs> difference between what's wow. online and what's on the DVD. How? Yeah. <laughs> Why would you put. How? How could you put that out? Just <laughs> yeah, Surely that's... just ADR it. Just have the director or Daniel Baldwin. He's great. Dude. Have him do all the voices. There's absolutely no way Mill Creek Entertainment... They're putting out boxes that have like a hundred movies on them. There's no way they're putting that God. level of loving attention to I any th- one of these things. Wow. It's it's even less than the all like the movies that Bruce Willis has done leading up to his um, like very upsetting retirement. Um, it, yeah. like, that level of quality is, mm. is, is Christopher Nolan stepping away from Warner Brothers levels of integrity compared to <laughs> yeah. um con- yeah. compared to this film yesterday's target. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Oh, anyway, let we start the movie and we see some some people are being robocoped. Oh no wait, they're being universal soldier. No, 12 monkeys. Zed. The they're being casualties. <laughs> <That's a great laughs> <scene. laughs> they're being X-Men. Um, yeah, and we cut to a David Bowie looking lady walking down the street and gets picked up by a cow man in a sequence that I forgot all about until I read this note three years later. <laughs> yep, I don't remember that. No, nope. uh, <laughs> barely, barely did. Um, we see George Costanza's boss uh, slash mm. the granddad who put his brain in the gardener and get out. Uh, he Fantastic. comes to. Oh, I do remember it now. Carry on. <laughs> he, he comes and recruits Danny. Daniel Billy Baldwin into the worst Avengers <laughs> ever. I need you, <laughs> A. Baldwin. I'd like you to look at these sketches. Look, buddy, I can't afford to buy whatever life insurance it is you're selling, okay? I barely make enough money to pay the rent. I'm not a sailor. I've been sent here to warn you. Thanks for the warning. Mr. Harper, they've already found you. And they know who you are. <laughs> Please, my superpower is saying it, saying everything that I think like a, not a real person. <laughs> That's also my superpower. Oh. <laughs> and mine, Damn. says the rest of the world. <laughs> yes, he needs him in the fight against evil Malcolm McDowell and his henchman, LeVar Burton from Star Trek, um, <laughs> yeah. who is psychic and keeps banging on about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, man. I- ironically, n- none of us are, so you do have to keep telling us. <laughs> I could tell you're thinking I'm a psychic. Oh, I wasn't. <laughs> Yes, you were. Oh, wow. God, he's good. He is good. Um, yeah. yeah. So they confront him. There's a fight. Um, they yeah. try to they try to grab Baldwin, and Baldwin hilariously sends a guy uh, flying through the air. But then he himself... <laughs> <It's> very... Yes. <laughs> That's the hubris of being a powerful magic psychic. Oh, you think those effects were weird? Check out this car crash. And uh, <laughs> Daniel Baldwin does the thing. And, he does uh, the thing. Rather... Th- the film does a thing to Daniel Baldwin. <laughs> Baldwin is also psychic, it seems. And he ends up in hospital. Yeah. Uh, then he leaves. And he's two words. A... Telekinesis. <laughs> he's he's, he's mind, mind cop and he's running around uh, in the nib <laughs> yeah. before Get Out finds him. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. a time travelling psychic from the future. And uh, <laughs> you, you've got two mates. Paul, his name is. <laughs> you've got two mates back here too, also from yeah. the future. And uh, you've wow. all lost your memories, and you've forgotten why you're here. Um, but you do you do live quite close together, fortunately. So yeah. uh, we just go find them. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Luckily, so the, the future the... sent their dollar psychics, so you all just ended up living here. <laughs> Just, just getting rubbish jobs and being vaguely, being really dissatisfied, but not being emotionally articulate enough to um, admit it to themselves. Look. Also, yeah, I do appreciate the irony of me saying emotionally articulate. Yeah. I ain't emotionally <laughs> that articulate. That was that wasn't emotional. That was just your regular mouth. <laughs> that was my regular inarticulacy. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, um, we couldn't afford for any one of these psychics to be a fucking Nicolas Cage style Vegas person. Although a little bit. Because Baldwin does show all of that family charisma he's got coursing through his veins when he decides he's going to go find the other two psychics. And one of them, Linda Fiorentino, is, <laughs> um, it's not, is, uh, it suddenly occurred to me that actually could have plausibly been her. But no, this is the yeah. year before Men in Black. She's fucking going to be huge. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's being she's hassled. She's in Dogma, everyone. She's in fucking Dogma. You back down, what were you in? Uh, yeah, being hassled in a casino by everyone. Uh, save her, Billy yeah. Baldwin. Save her from the terrible choices she's made for herself. <laughs> she's she's got um she does have a bit of next disease doesn't she um she can tell like what's going to happen just five seconds beforehand which is um it's very helpful very good yeah. um unfortunately uh it's going relatively well recruiting her but then a firearm that billy baldwin is holding um accidentally goes off not a great look for a baldwin and uh yeah she runs Ouch. away yeah <laughs> that's a thrilling escape sequence Followed by some thrilling chemistry, and I literally, genuinely fall asleep and have to rewind. <laughs> oh, I no. sleep. I slept for twenty minutes and missed one plot point, which is what you want, you know. It I, is. I think it's nice to have that sense of security. <laughs> I could just go off again. I'm watching this thinking, "Ah, oh, Death on the Nile is going to be good later." <laughs> and um, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Poor bastard. Damn it! <laughs> oh um, God. An and, and 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 yeah, look, he takes her to a diner and uh, yes. is vaguely th- is vaguely threatening in a masculine way. <laughs> I love that. It turns me on so much. Yes, it turns, and that also turns out to be where third friend is. You're a wizard, Wesley Snipes. What? <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm. I'm really not. Okay, how about this? And then he does some extra special telekinesis and <laughs> smashes him into a, into the wall. Makes and he's like, all right. <laughs> he goes, right. You made Whoa. your point. <laughs> and then cool. he can control fire. Great. So we have the and three. And I can inc- control you both because I behave like a, a actual narcissist <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> oh, but God. I'm right, well, so it's fine. Florentino uh, takes off with her old beau, Eric Estrada. Oh. Um, but he literally kidnaps her, nearly killing her in the process. It's okay, though, because the guy she ran off with was actually going to betray her. So thank God Baldwin is here to save her from her choices by force. By force. You don't need those pills. Maybe I do. Nah, you don't. You with me now? He pretty much says. <laughs> the gang assembled. They get a motel room together, and he sets off her memory and sex hormones by remembering their classic food order: two steaks, three salads, and a bottle of scotch. Oh my god! <laughs> I send up uh, two steaks, uh, three salads, and uh, two bottles of scotch, please. Suddenly, I'm just animalistically in the mood for married couple sex. <laughs> Don't let him get you. That's how Daniel Baldwin and a narcissist will do it. Um, <laughs> All these steaks and side salads. And uh, and um, uh, what's his face? Carter, the pyromaniac, goes. Yeah. yeah, I also have a memory, but he does. He does stress it to point out that it's not because of the room service thing. For a different, <laughs> definitely for not diff- homoerotic thing. <laughs> for a different, better uh, thing than just this fucking guy ordering room service. <laughs> Oh wait, I think I just rem- I'm starting to remember. I think it's just that. Yeah. Well, so, um, Baldwin claws the 2025 equivalent of an iPad out of his leg, and uh, finds out that the three of them have been sent back here to save a boy in a bow tie. <gasps> his vision. We're must all mind cops. Yeah. <laughs> this beautiful um, soul must live into the future. Into 2025. Imagine. Can you remember when films set in 2025 were just fucking. Uh, utopia just how space age even what it now like watching movies that are set in the 20s <laughs> or like cyberpunk originally set in the 20s it's like wow the 20s <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be unbelievable mate and i can't wait for every minute of it the, pe- the potential mate our heroes are in trouble though because four guys have surrounded them completely on one side <laughs> and uh, they all shoot their no. guns <laughs> yeah. how are they gonna get out of this or scene missing or perhaps i fall asleep again <laughs> i don't know but they wake up in uh, the messianic bowtie kid's house. Steve Urkel yeah. he is. 
um, and Get Out is there. Yeah. We have dedicated psychics making this, masking this house with their powers 24 hours a day. Wow. Wouldn't that be easier with a smaller house? I like this house. Do you take any shifts masking it? <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Do I Go look like a mask, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. It's a really um, nice house. Yeah, when... sure, you know, it has, it's not very well insulated. There's no double glazing. The <laughs> cellar's a bit, uh, like, musty and a bit dank. Yeah. Um, and the gas doesn't work sometimes, and you have to run the shower for two minutes before it goes hot. And then it goes cold again, but I do really like the house. <laughs> and it's definitely worth putting all these resources into it. Linda finally remembers that Billy Baldwin is her husband from the future, so she can surrender the last of her agency, and they have a bit of a source. Um, and she then doesn't have any lines in the rest of the movie, to what I remember. <laughs> I don't think the movie does have any lines, oh, guys. Because um, they're Swap- surrounded again. Oh, no, but oh, they no, brought more than four attack. people this time. The SWAT guys attack X Manor. Only Wolverine isn't here to make it to help them or make it fun. No, so, Daniel Baldwin is though, and yeah. um, but but he doesn't. He's not there for a lot of this. Um, yeah. A lot of it's centered around um, pyromaniac Jeff. And yes, all of and his how hurt talents. he gets. <laughs> he just keeps getting shot and hurt over and over again, and nobody else does. God damn it! The his role in this movie has just been to like. He'll use his powers to light a cigar or or a knife or something, <laughs> and then he'll stare at it as if going, "Oh, what the fuck have I done?" for about five seconds, <laughs> and then I? hand it over. <laughs> Why? Um, but but yeah, he takes care of a few people, I think, and then uh, Lavar Burton shows up and kidnaps. Uh, well, he kills kidnaps get young out. Roland. He kills, he kills get, get out. out, and then um, you know, at least look get happy out though. It. At least he died keeping Uncle's whereabouts. Oh shit, there he is. Yeah. Just it, the the super secret hiding place he had with him behind the curtain uh, didn't work when he just runs out and just kneels quietly next to um, Get Out. Damn it! And Levar- even even Lavar Burton manages to catch that, and he's blind according to Star Trek. So, <laughs> wow! But Lavar Burton, you're from the future too. You've been tricked. Malcolm McDowell is actually evil. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> you're lying. You saw how good he was to his wife. Meanwhile, fucking Levar- um, Malcolm McDowell's outside, and he's like. Okay, okay, we've got LeVar Burton in sight. Take the shot. But the boy isn't even with him. Take the <laughs> shot, damn it! <laughs> Why? Help no one. But they do. I, uh, I don't know. I just... I really hope I get to shoot a kid soon. <laughs> oh, God, I hope so. Nobody wants to shoot the boy. Um, you know, Burton's kind of had it coming, they all figured. He's been pissing a lot of people yeah. off with his constant psychic references. <laughs> I know what's in your pocket. Oh, fuck me. It is strange delivery. <laughs> So you, you've got to deliver it somehow, you know. McDowell goes to shoot the boy himself. But yeah. wait, we can fix your infertile wife and give you a beautiful baby boy. Me, Daniel <laughs> Billy Baldwin. <laughs> your son will be born on January 28th. That's a lie. I've seen the database. There's no such date. There is. That's the day that I was born. <laughs> he comes out with the, like the stars in the eyes, steam and smoke. <laughs> Oh boy, I can't wait Dada. to have you as a son. <laughs> did you did you say Dada? Did you did, did you say the French? <laughs> <laughs> you you know think... it. You're a great son. So McDowell Abstract is expressionist. D- McDowell is understandably delighted, so he agrees to stop the movie. And uh, Baldwin explains what would have happened if we could have afforded an epilogue, and it's the end. Yeah, it is that Malcolm McDowell didn't want to see him again, <laughs> which they could have filmed. You know. <laughs> Oh, <sighs> Christ. Paul, what did you make of yesterday's target? Look, I, I, I was quite amused and entertained throughout. Um, <laughs> this, is one of those, this is one of those films where it was either very silly um, yeah. or even the dull moments were, they were a feast of, <laughs> why, what are they doing? Uh, yeah. even, you know, e- even the dull moments was just, people people don't talk like this even movie yeah. people don't talk like this um and it was just because it because it was just eh, i've come to find you why well you see you're you're a psychic yeah. and i'm here to help i was put in place uh by a group and malcolm mcdowell's out to get you oh yeah well i'm just a guy no you're not this is who you are and 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 it was just that for 75 minutes um yeah. of and and it kind of kept even even the moments that weren't the I you know I found the concept kind of ambitious and loopy especially for such a low budget movie, um, yeah. and the silliness and the absolute like bafflingness of the mistakes that were made in between the fun loopy bits 
kept yeah. it at the fringes of mediocrity or or blandness. So I just found it overall really charming. Yeah. Um, and every little thing, every little movement tickled me. Mm. So yeah. it, uh, you know, for, uh, especially the bits that I could hear. <laughs> yeah, that was a plus. The low production has to be has to be acknowledged, I think, as a factor. You know, there was no chance of finding any of this looking or sounding particularly great <laughs> uh, with this particular transfer and the no. uh, way in which this TV movie has endured. I can't imagine they've got so many great elements to work with. Um, I think for me, if they just cast someone a bit more charismatic than Daniel Baldwin in the lead, mm. I think I probably would have gotten on board. Like I maybe even would have bought into the character a bit more. You know, the moments when he is being just like, I know what's mm. best for you, kind of old fashioned yeah. action man without any self effacingness mm. or uh, uh, sort of self awareness. Just a little charisma would have gone a long way uh, to help me along with that. <laughs> And probably kept me a bit more involved through the very lackluster mm. and kind of rubbish action sequences. Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually, I, I, I found him. For me, I thought he was as charming as he could possibly have been with that script and direction. Oh, I like, feel I like just, someone could have made this work. Nicholas Cage oh, could have made this work. Cage could have made it work. Gina, John Claude Van Damme. But I feel like this could have been Sleepy Cage. I feel like this is the kind of movie that would have been Sleepy Cage. Yeah, but even then he would have yelled something weird. <laughs> Yeah, but just a Jacob would have come out. A Jacob yeah. would have come out. Anyway, we we must keep this to a quick I'll fix thing, your but... infertile wife. <laughs> I'll do it. You know I can do it. <laughs> I'll I'm fucking do it. I'm your son. <laughs> yeah, Daddy. <laughs> Daddy. Come on, Daddy. Like yeah, so we know the Nick Cage it needed to be. Um, yeah, it's there's nothing like here next. to elevate this above what it is, which is just a thoroughly mundane sort of sci-fi action that has a somewhat neat premise there's a couple of cool things we'll yeah. get to in quickfire but yeah it's just it, it's the terminator it's the anti-terminator in, in premise mm. um mm. just well no it is the terminator it's just the, you know traveling back in time to make sure a kid stays alive um mm. slash yeah. eventually looper would pick up on yeah, some exactly. of this probably the obvious one better thing um yeah that's mine <laughs> so yeah. i'm i'm the obvious <laughs> of o, o, the uh, OBT, probably, that's that's me. I'll go along Obvious with thing. But um, yeah. Nevertheless, it's it's got some moments to it, as we shall now address in the quick. Lovely. When that ridiculous mm. car crashes, the radiator of the car is just spraying out water, and I've never seen that in a crashed car before. It's a nice detail mm. that they're just the front like, of this car just has water spraying out of it. I feel like you'd see that in a Nolan movie if uh, <laughs> he cared about cars in any way. Um, Literally he'd show it how it really went down yeah. and then Michael Gambon would be there <laughs> um, I, I enjoyed the conceit of the opening credit sequence with the flashes of you know, the operation and, and the things going on um, although I suspect now that it was there to pad the film out to feature length um, yeah. I, I still I still liked it because it showed, it showed artistry yeah um, I don't know what the line is uh, the line is no get in that car and I don't know that's, what the yeah, that's one is. of mine. So, yeah. when Daniel Baldwin is rescuing Linda Fiorentino, Fiorentino, right. um, yeah. he's he's yelling at her to get out of the car where her boyfriend has kidnapped her, mm. and she gets out. He's like, "Get out of the car!" And she gets out, and then uh, there's a pause, and then get in, get in that car. <laughs> yeah, get out of the car. Get in that car. <laughs> and I, I, I also really appreciated that. I thought yeah, that was a good line. It's a good silly line. When they kill Eric Estrada, Linda Fiorentino's ex boyfriend, they shoot mm. him and it's a good squib. A good little squib nice. moment. It bursts on the front and back. It's good stuff. Looks okay. good. Always looks good. Nice. Um, so I, I enjoyed the way Richard Hurd. Is that get out? Uh, the old guy? Yes, it is. The way he interacted with Roland, um, who you've christened Steve Urkel, uh, <laughs> because it was very much, uh, what's that, Skippy? <laughs> Someone's trapped, Greta's trapped down the well? You know, it, like, because it was like, yeah. what's that, Roland? You want me to come with you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that way we don't have to pay the ah. kid to say anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fucking hate children. Just so it's, it's both the delivery and the sort of just... Uh, the actual line here mm. of just um you know they're getting away in a car or something like that is they got to the car 
Forget it. The car's been taken care of. It's going nowhere. Yeah, well, it's going nowhere pretty bloody fast. This is one of my favourite so moments because <laughs> not only do I realise that the throaty mobster might be Australian and not English, um, but Great. when he's when the phone call's over, there's a beat and then he just does a <laughs> face. Like it's it's half a second long and it's just like a, <laughs> I'm so angry. I could fold a bit of paper and then it's gone. It's just such an impotent <laughs> fucking expression <laughs> of anger from a mobster. <laughs> I'm so like angry, that. Kenneth. <laughs> um, Baldwin getting hit by a car was very good. Yeah. Um, oh, the scene transition of Le- that's like you've got Levar Burton's silhouetted mm. hat at the front of screen, uh-huh. where he's look he's looking down a corridor because he's in the hospital, I think, where Daniel Baldwin was, mm. and the scene changes to the hosp- to a hospital room, the empty hospital room. Uh-huh. With the same shot of the silhouette uh-huh. in the foreground, that's and good. the nurse walks into the hospital. It was again artistry, mate. This film, <laughs> yesterday's artist, more like. I can't believe Emmanuel Lebesky was the cinematographer. <laughs> <laughs> it was only because uh, Orofsky quit because <laughs> of because he's a insane. lack of pasties. He's just a dangerously insane man. Um, <laughs> he went off to yell something about Dune at some movie producers. <laughs> Um, I do enjoy the angle of there's this wizened mentor character who's been guiding our characters for out. And then when they get their memories back, they remember that one of the things they're here to do is to make sure that he doesn't stay as leader because he's going to fall yeah. prey to his own prejudices. Mm. And that this is an order that actually came from him and that he has mm. to try and take that on board. There's not time for that to play out or get a hint of yeah. it. But nevertheless, it's kind of a it's an interesting idea, the idea of. The person, you are this great, kind, lovely character right now, but the person yeah. you become will not be good for the movement. I, I, I thought they were sent back by him. They were. He, because, he ends up yeah. sort of having that oh, self-awareness, which is also a bit confusing. It's, it's not, I think, like, because he realises that Roland should have been given control of the organisation from yeah. an early age, because he's a genius and would have been a better tactician. I um, thought around, that he... Oh, I thought there was some problematic stuff that he was going to get up to, that he was ultimately going to get into thinking that the 11-hour kids um, are, are wrong in oh, some way. But I, I thought it was well, a tactical thing, but I, I'm, I'm willing to say that he's responsible for something bad and should, should go. Well, because it was bad enough that they was, they're back here to kill him if he doesn't give up, you know, give yeah. up the leadership. Anyway. Yeah, but that's, that's, the, that's 20s style, mate. That's how Next. we roll. Yeah. Um, Next. But yeah, uh, I, I, nevertheless, I liked the confrontation and like having to broach that with him. It's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed the different ways of demonstrating Linda Fiorentino's clairvoyance process because of <laughs> the first time with the roulette, you have the next style thing of um, uh, of seeing. You know, she sees how the roulette thing's going to play out, and it's no, it's yeah. no frills. It doesn't announce it, and I, I thought, oh, they've, he's already made the bet. What's he gonna? What's What's she going to do now? He's already made the bet. Oh, she's just, she's realizing it's, it's a premonition. Good. But then <laughs> later on, they're discussing something. I think it's um, in the finale house. Um, or it might be when they're surrounded by four people. And the three of them are discussing what to do next. And Linda Fiorentino is just sort of looking thoughtfully on listening to Daniel Baldwin talk, as we all do. And she suddenly interrupts with, get away from the window! And it, there's no... There's no sign of her having yeah. a you know a premonition yeah. at the time. That's good. Uh, they didn't they didn't feel the need to go through the same sort of stylistic choice with the roulette, which was good. That's good. I like that. Artist artistry. Trusting I don't know what else to tell you. The audience. Yeah. Um, I think Lavar Burton's fun. I think he's very over the top <laughs> and silly, and I yes. think it kind of brings something to the movie that I was sorely hoping for. Their avoidance is not an exact science, Mister Holden. Not exactly an empty house, is it? It's a pretty baffling performance at times. Very interesting yeah. emphasis on uh, <laughs> like a future uh, man on very surprising parts of sentences. That's how crazy, we talk in the future. Crazy future man. God, what it would be like to be a crazy future man. <laughs> um, I like uh, um, Baldwin for his extra special, intense uh, telekinetic moves. He'd also flick his head just to mm-hmm. show that he really meant business, and this was yeah. a real. No punches pulled, sort of telekinetic move. Not <laughs> needed, that. not needed at all. But um, he just wanted uh-huh. to. It made a difference for him, you know. Okay, um, my second to last one, my penultimate one, is uh-huh. um, the female computer voice 
who has a voice has a line in this. I don't remember the line, and I don't remember the voice well enough to do an impression. But I've written down that this character could be Hedonism Bot's sister. Foundation address one one six eight. When they have Carter, uh, the fire fire maniac, uh, sterilize the knife to operate on um, a a Daniel Baldwin's leg. That's for sure. Um, he sterilizes the knife. And uh, Linda Fiorentino is like, now go watch TV. And like, all right. And she goes down and puts on a porno. <laughs> yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, ah, oh, in the background. <laughs> it's it's flawless cover. What? Watching the stories. I liked the idea of the masks projecting this image of an empty house. They're just standing mm. there with these crystal balls um, doing their thing. It was a cool idea. And it was presented in an interesting way of these just silent, just pillars, human pillars, essentially. Um, yeah. And it was a really, yeah, really cool idea. I wonder what it uh, stole <laughs> off of for that. Yeah. And the the explosion in the corridor at the end um, from Jeff the pyromaniac looked yeah. good because it, it yeah it was a it was a wide shot and you could you saw it all and because it, it's an enclosed space the explosion yeah. filled the space completely yes. and it wasn't just a weird cutaway to like a lick of flame yeah it it looked really good yeah absolutely it did yeah. And that's good. You need you need little action moments. And there were some parts of the car chase that looked a little, a little alright. Although yeah. I did just oh, yeah. watch Pedro Almodovar's um, "Woman on, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown" today, and I had a better car chase in that movie than oh. in this action movie. So that's fun. But then again, that is Pedro Almodovar. Um, okay, my last one is a moment where just for a second this movie went full Neil Breen. It is one? It, it's yes. a line that happens near the end. And it's it's something I can't get it exactly. I'll sample it. But the line is something like, "Is um." We were trying to find out who we were, and who we'd be now. And then they like they were clearly so impressed. They say it again a few moments later. Roland had a vision that we would be in danger if we met the younger versions of ourselves, so we left. We were trying to find out who we were, and who we'd be now. Who we'd be now. <laughs> <laughs> the voiceover comes a... in just to reiterate who we'd be now it's just who such an were, awkward was. way of phrasing the fucking thing <laughs> i loved it who were i who were i now <laughs> did you pass with this guy but yeah <laughs> so that's gonna do it i think we didn't ask the og Beautiful. team we never do for these quick things we're sparing you it. the indignity of having to watch yesterday's target mm-hmm. um how are you feeling about sweating bullets now we've watched our first one <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm more in my wheelhouse with this than um, <laughs> the than low budget horror. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I can I can appreciate this on a on a more emotionally resonant level. I think. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I I look forward to seeing how it evolves and how similar <laughs> to or whether dissimilar. I can maintain that position. <laughs> yeah. I look forward yeah. to seeing how similar or dissimilar these are because the Gorehouse Greats did definitely have a mode. And I'll be curious mm. to see if the that the same can be said of sweating bullets. Sweating but we'll, bullets. We'll find out a little bit more next week. Until next then, time. this has been your one quick thing. Fuck off, everyone. That's what we say, right? I've, I'm pretty sure that's what we say. But then okay. we just, but then we very hurriedly say, "Oh no, wait." <laughs> oh, wait, just oh.